tell you some good news. I want to share some good news with you. Um, I forgot to mention a few weeks ago, uh, Roland, uh, Roland Creason, I don't see him here yet. Uh, hopefully he's okay. Roland's fought cancer in the last couple of years himself, which most people don't know about. So he struggles through uh, the healing process of what he's going through, but most of the time he does pretty good. But anyway, he actually shared the constitutional Christian with a fellow king, Jeff Cruer, who has a radio program and a television program. So a few weeks ago, I, I last minute, he called me up, asked me if we can come up there and do a radio program on with him about the Constitution of Christian because he actually watched it and liked it. So we went up there to do the program, and we only had about a 10-minute time slot is what it boiled down to, a, just, just about 10 minutes. But we actually got phone calls from here in New Orleans of people who heard the program requesting the Constitution of Christian. Just this week, the reason I'm bringing it up now, Audrey found on, on the voicemail in, the, in the, uh, the library, another person from New Orleans, a lady who lives in Metairie, also called to get the Constitution of Christian and mentioned she would like to maybe a visit and attend church from time to time. So here's the reason I'm telling you this and hopefully the people who might be watching online. If you can get us to talk to people I mean, just, just take and get a copy of the Constitutional Christian, and you've got nothing to lose. Turn it over to a radio program, a local radio program across the country, wherever you live. You never know what's going to happen. This was a program called Ringside Politics. So I'm thinking, like, well, why would they want to get me onto a Ringside Politics program? And he has a four-hour radio show five days a week here in New Orleans. And, uh, well, because he talks about religion, too. So then it went so well, he called and asked if I'd come do his TV show. And so, unfortunately, when he called me, he gave me the next day, and I couldn't go the next day. I had you know, jobs lined up and, and stuff coming in town. And so I'm going to pray that he'll give us another shot at that. Yeah. So here's my point. I really believe that if we, if we actually put our heads together and focus, either through social media, uh, through means, hand, of, hand to another person, through contact, well, well, we don't have the money to go on television, I think we can make a difference and get people contacting us. I really do. When we ran the TV special, remember, Audrey was on the phone for a week, she, for the first couple of days when the programs went out, day and night, answering phones. Like, she was up 2 o'clock in the morning calling people back on the West Coast and, and talking about giving them the materials. So I think God's positioned us in a way that we can make an effective change in people's lives. We just got to find a way to get it out. And here was, here was something I would have never dreamed about. Actually, people calling and getting, getting a copy of what's going on. They're going to go online. And, and uh, who knows down the road, people will be walking in the doors. So anyway, that's very encouraging to me. And I wanted to mention to you here in New Orleans, because if we could do something on a regular basis... I think we can grow the church. And if we can do this across the country, we can grow in more cities. Because I believe the message you guys have given us, they're powerful, they're important, and they're effective in people's lives. So with that, I also want to mention that this week was the anniversary of Tammuz 9. The two-year anniversary of Tammuz 9 for the United States in a very drastic thing that happened. You know, I don't know what the people online are thinking about. What is Tammuz now? Well, today is Tammuz 14. Here's why I'm bringing this out. We're thinking all the time on our terms, not God's terms. Well, Tammuz is one of the months of God's calendar. It actually was named probably after it came out of Babylon because it's very similar to a Babylon God. Tammuz 9 was June 26, 2015, when the Supreme Court passed the law approving same-sex marriage. This, year, this week was the two-year anniversary. So a lot of things has been going on since that day. It was like the whole world has changed. I mean, I mean, literally, it has changed. <laughs> male to female has changed. <laughs> female to male has changed. I mean, you got people out there making love to trees. People want to marry flowers. It's gender neutral. It's like, my goodness, everything's being created in Satan after his own image, which is non-gender, where God says he created a male and female. I made a joke in, in the News and Nuggets, say, hey, I feel like I'm a turtle today. Just turn me over and get me out of the sun. <laughs> I feel like I'm a turtle. 
We're laughing about it because it's so nonsensical. But it's true. These people literally are doing this. Audrey sent me an email so that I can use for news and nuggets, but I couldn't find anything that wasn't vulgar that I could use. I said, this is pitiful. Well, anyway, I just wanted to mention that to you because if you didn't see News Nuggets and Insights from yesterday, please go online and go to God's Unchanging Word and watch it. It's a powerful program. We will probably use it as a mailer. It's 54 minutes and 54 seconds long. Couldn't have done that again if we tried. 54 minutes and 54 seconds. And we're talking about all the events going on around the world because on the very morning we're doing a program, they're announcing Korea shooting an anti-ballistic missile capable of hitting the United States now. So we began with that program. We talked about Canada, how Canada is like it's on a toboggan downslide now uh, for removing Christians, how to sh actually shut down a Christian school because it was violating the rights of other people in Canada. And you have to wonder, and we're going to be doing a program in the future and got on, on News Nuggets and Insights, you know, are Christians the next wave of anti-Semitism? Right. Our, our own way, and they'll come up with a name for it. You got to, because it's coming to that. The attack is upon God and God's way. So that program, if you get it, send it to everybody you know. It doesn't cost you anything. Just forward it. You'll lose a lot of friends, but that's okay. You'll help them. <laughs> You'll help them. All right, so that was it for what I want to announce. All right, so now, Danny's, Danny's little quips. We've got to create some name for Danny here. He does, believe it or not, he does a lot of work. He was, he was in study, and I said, what are you working on? I thought he was working on a sermon. He was looking for quotes to put on the board. If all is not lost, where is it? You know, that's, that's true, because you take a bath every day of the week. You, every, you know, you got 365 baths at the end of the year. Where are they? You keep taking them. All right. It's easier to get older than it is to get wiser. That's true. The first rule in holes, first rule of holes, is if you're in one, stop digging. <laughs> It's like bar borrowing your way out of poverty. All right. It was all so different before everything changed. <laughs> That's funny stuff. I like these. All right. I wish the buck stopped here. I could use a few. <laughs> but that's it for Danny. All right. The sermon I'm going to give you today is... It's, um, I'm giving you the intro for it because I created a little video intro, but I didn't get to finish it all yet. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to do this as a card and a mailer. It's not a complicated sermon by any means. I think what this sermon should help do, though, is reinforce and help us to focus and reflect on God's way before we make the mistakes. Before we make the mistakes. So it's a warm sermon. I've done it in the past, but I've never done it as PowerPoint. So today I want to do it as PowerPoint. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to actually play the video. It's only a minute long, minute and four seconds long. But it doesn't have sound with it yet. It is moving a little slower than I want it. So when we go post-edit this, it's going to, I'm going to rework this little video piece that I put together. And it's going to go in the front of the video that's going to come out. When the video is over, we're going to come right to the sermon. So and then I'll introduce what's going on. I'll say hello again. But this is for the tape. So I'm going to just give you the background for what we're doing. And then you can write in or get your own tape at the front door. All right, so every tape we mail out for here in New Orleans to save us money, because we're cheap, pick it up at your door on the way out. <laughs> so we get every sermon there. So here's the video, and then I'll go right into the sermon.
Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to our Sabbath service, and welcome to the room. The room is a story that was uh, being put around through internet and through word of mouth beginning in the late 90s. Of course, the author, his, the, there's confusion of who the author actually is, but it's not my point to bring out the author or the behind the scenes. What I want to do today with you, I want to give you a story that I can leave something with to help reinforce your thinking, to help you reflect on God's way before you make mistakes. The Room is a powerful, biblically-based, principled story, very much like the parables or the, or the allegories told by Jesus. And that is the way I'm going to share <clears throat> this sermon today with you. I'm going to tell you this sermon through a story. I'm going to give you the foundation and the background, lay it together with the scripture, tie it into a parable, and then reinforce the story and drive it home with the very same scriptures we begin with. The focus today is on two verses in the Bible. Just two verses. And we will spend the next 45 minutes to an hour defining those two verses through this story and a parable told by Jesus Christ. Why parables? We've discussed that in the past. There's several reasons why there are parables, and I'm going to take a different approach to the parables today because I want to focus on a more positive issue of why parables. In the book of Matthew, the disciples come to Jesus and say to him, why do you speak to them in parables? We've talked about this before. You know the story. I don't have to repeat it all. But let me share something with you to talk about the two-edged sword of the parables. When you grew up as a child, the Sunday school teachers, if you went to Sunday school, most of us did, before we changed to keeping the Sabbath day, they told us the parables were to make things plain. Of course, according to the Bible, Jesus said he gave them parables so that they would not understand. I would not reinforce that over and over and over over the years. Now, today I want to talk about the other side of the coin. All right, so the two-edged sword does this. It's first, it hides the meaning from those that Jesus doesn't want to understand. All right, that's the very first reason, and that is the reason Jesus Christ gave that information in the Scriptures. In verse 11, he says this, And he answered, he said unto them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not been given. That's amazing. You know, when I first realized that many, many years ago after coming to the church, I said, wow, oh, Jesus deliberately hides the truth from people? And I, I'm, I'm originally thinking, well, how is that fair? That's not fair to people that they don't have a chance to learn the truth. But the truth is the way Jesus Christ said that if he gave them the truth, they wouldn't repent. He'd have to destroy them. So what Jesus simply means is that he does, he's, he hides the truth at this time. Until they're in the frame of mind, and for many that's going to take the second resurrection, so that they can receive the truth and have the opportunity to repent. It's a very merciful, loving way to do things. The second reason for the, the, two, the uh, parables is that they paint a story that cements the message that Jesus wants you to understand in your mind. So if God has opened your mind, and he wants you to understand the parable that Jesus gave that just blinded so many people now becomes a, an anchor to you. Isn't it amazing how that works? It's like the same story in the receiving of the message of Jesus Christ. So why parables? Matthew 13 going on. Oh, I got this in here twice for some reason. All right, going on now. Luke 16 verses 19 through 31. The rich man and Lazarus. So I'm going to take and I'm going to read this story first and then I'm going to come back to it and then we're going to get into the two verses that I want to talk about today and why I'm telling you the story of the room and how it ties into Lazarus and the rich man. All right. So I'm going to go through I'm going to read it here first. And I'm going to come back to this story and show you how the room 
The parables and this story all tie together to reinforce the message. All right, so I'm going to begin reading in Luke 16 and verse 31. All right, before I do that, let me, let me tell you about this, because I know what's going to happen when people hear this. This is one of those two-edged swords parables that drives people crazy. This is the one that the general Protestant religion believes clarifies the afterlife and reinforces heaven and hell. Honest to goodness. If you read this story, they believe that's exactly what this is doing here. And so if you're talking to someone that the dead know nothing and they're in the grave and they're waiting for the resurrection, people will use this story to tell you how that's wrong. Honest to goodness, that's absolutely true. And that's how the two-edged sword seems to work. Blinds one and opens up another. So I, wanted to, I put this in here for a reason, is that probably the next time I do the sermon, not a part two, because it's going to open up a lot of questions to people who may be watching the program for the first time or new people who's on the list who hasn't been converted yet or haven't been baptized. Because, because the questions it's going to raise, I want to address. So the next time I'll probably come back and do the sermon, The Rich Man and Lazarus, on the next program all right, that, we, that we're working on. But let me read this now, and then I'm going to show you the points I want to try to make from this. So there was a rich man who was clothed with purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which is interesting. Pay attention to Lazarus because we know the story of Jesus. Jesus literally actually resurrects Lazarus, who was laid at the gate full of sores and is desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, dogs came and he licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried away in the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, my Bible says, yours might say hell or another word, he lifted up his eyes and he was being tormented, sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So there you have the, he's in hell, an ever burning fire. You got all these things going on in this story, which Christianity has grabbed to believe that people die, they go to hell, or they go to heaven. All right. Verse 24. And he cried and he said, Behold, he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from here to you cannot. And neither can they pass to us that they would come from there. Then he said, I pray you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them that lest they also come to this place of torment. And I will come back now to these last three verses and tie in this story to the last three verses and drive on the point with the two scriptures I'm going to give you in just a couple moments. Verse 29. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if, if one went from them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though someone rose from the dead. There is the parable. Is the sound working right with you all? It sounds like it's going in and out to me. It's working okay for you all? Okay. All right, so there's the parable. The story of the room is like a modern-day version of that story, the room. Now, you may have heard the story of the room before. I actually did it a few years back. It's a story about life after death, and it was supposedly written by a 17-year-old, but it's actually written by someone, someone else who had it in a book that the 17-year-old, I believe he was in South America, who actually wrote it as an essay and turned it in and who died in an automobile accident sometime later. So that's where all the mix-up comes in. 
we're going to focus on the story and tying it in to all of this. All right, so you ready? Long buildup, almost, almost 18 minutes to build up to tell you the story now. But I had to give you the background to make this work. So now you're ready to begin. So we're going to begin with a phrase that we've all heard. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. You, you shake, everybody's shaking their heads. Yeah, you've all heard it. Well, I should have done this. I could have done that. If I'd only, would, would, would I have done this, these things wouldn't have happened to me. It's, by that time, it's too late. You've already done it. Had there not been the mercy of Jesus Christ, there would be no hope for any of us. So now, this is going to help you, God willing, so that you don't have a shoulda, coulda, woulda moment that maybe through God's inspiration, he can guide your thoughts before you get into that state of mind in your life. Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what we have to do now all right, so we're going we're to have the story, and we're going to get the two verses that I was telling you about. Matthew 12, here are the two verses. But I say unto you, you ready? You ready? But I say to you that for every idle word that a man speaks, they will give account in the day of judgment. What do you think about that? We've heard it. You know that. You've read that scripture before. I haven't just told you anything new. How did it impact you when you read it? Now, remember, Isaiah said, my ways, not your ways. Your thoughts, not my thoughts. All right, so when we read this, do we really believe it? Every day when you go through your life, you make mistakes, you say something. Something you say, oh, I was just kidding. I didn't mean that. Or you do something that you regret. What if we could have God's Holy Spirit help us to prevent from getting into a problem? Because you see there's a cause and effect. Here's the second verse. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There you go. So somebody might say, well, I'll just keep my mouth shut. It don't work that way. It does not work that way. So this is the sermon that's wrapped around these two scriptures. Now we're going to be ready to tell the story, and then I'm going to come back to these two, two scriptures. All right? We're going to come back to these two scriptures, and we're going to come back to Lazarus. Matthew 10, God says, Or not two sparrows sold for a cup of coin, and are not, if one of them falls to the ground, part of your father's will. But every hair of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than sparrows. That literally just reinforces every idle word, believe it or not. In other words, God's knowledge and his will in your life is even to the point of a single hair of grain that falls out of your head. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time trying to comprehend all of that. Not that I don't believe it, because I absolutely believe it. But I don't understand everything I believe. You know, that's where, that's where Thomas, and I got a great name for that. Remember Thomas says, please, he says, he says, do Thomas. And he says, I do believe, he said. Remember when he touched Christ and put his hand in, into the hole of his hand and into his side? He says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, when I came into the church, there was many things I learned. I didn't understand them. But I could repeat them. I could live by them. I could tell you what they were. But they didn't find a place in my home, in my heart, in my lips. That took time. Do you realize the love of God takes time? The more you focus on the will of God, the more you will find the love of God. Through the love of God will be the pouring out of spirit upon your heart, which will guide your lips. Do you realize that at, at points in your life when you're so close to God that the Holy Spirit literally helps stop you in your tracks from making mistakes? 
Sure it does, because you see, that spirit, those angels around you also will guide you from who knows how many times we, we don't get into an accident because there's an angel around us. So this, what I'm telling you today is, is what I'm hoping for. This is a very soft, a very personal, and I hope a very warm message to help us to understand that every single thing we do, our every single thought, our every word, our every breath is monitored by the Father. If we could do that every day, don't you agree that maybe each day we will make less and less mistakes and be accountable less and less for the problems we go through? I tried one time, I remember really hard during the Days of Unleavened Bread after Passover. I was focused when I was younger and with Jesus Christ, he lived his whole life and never made a single mistake, not one sin. And I said, well, I'm going to see if I can get through the first week of unleavened bread without sinning. I didn't make it one day without saying, please forgive me, a bad thought. I don't remember what it was. I said, my goodness, I can't even get through a single day without having to ask God to intervene in my life. So I really hope that this will help us as a body become closer to not only God but to each other. All right, so now we're ready for the room. I'm going to read through this story, and I'm going to try not to do much ad lib, but I'm going to go through the whole story. It's a little long, but I've put some graphics to it, so hopefully it won't be too boring. But with that background that I gave you, hopefully it will hit a nerve. In that place between wakefulness, can we do something with the sound? I got terrible feedback coming in. Must be way too high or something. Is that better? Can you all hear it? Okay, it was like, all right, we'll start again. In that place between wakefulness and dreams, I found myself in the room. There were no distinguishing features, save for one wall covered with small index card files. There were ones like in libraries that list titles by author or subject in an alphabetical order. But these files, which were stretched from floor to ceiling and right to left as far as the eye could see and had very different headings. As I walked up to the wall of files, the first to catch my attention was one that read, People I Have Liked. I opened it and began flipping through the cards. I quickly shut it. Shocked to realize that I recognized the names written on each one. And then, without being told, I knew exactly where I was. This lifeless room with its small files was a crude catalog system for my entire life. I'm pausing here for a second because I want that to sink in. God just, we read the scripture, every idle word is accounted for. Somewhere from the throne of God, unless repented of, God has recorded a catalog system. And today we look at things in video, a DVD file of every moment of your life. The actions of my every moment, big and small, they were written in detail my memory couldn't match. A sense of wonder and curiosity mixed with horror stirred within me as I began randomly opening files and exploring their content. Some brought joy and sweet memories. Others, a sense of shame and regret so intense that I would look over my shoulder to see if anyone was watching. A file named Friends was next to one marked Friends I Have Betrayed. Titles range from common, everyday things, to the not so common, books I have read, lies I have told, comfort I have given, jokes I have laughed at. Some were almost hilarious in their exactness. 
things I have yelled at my brothers and sisters. Others I couldn't laugh at. Things I have done in anger. Things I have muttered under my breath at my parents. I never cease to be surprised by the contents. Often, there were many more chords than I expected, sometimes less than I had hoped. The sheer volume of the life that I had lived overwhelmed me. Could it be possible that I had time in my 17 years to write each of these thousands or millions of cards? But each card confirmed the truth. Each card was written in my own handwriting. Each card was signed with my signature. When I pulled out the file marked songs I had listened to, I realized the files grew to contain in their contents. The cards were packed tightly, and yet after two or three yards, I hadn't found the end of the file. I shut it, shamed not so much by the quality of the music, but the, by more by the vast amount of time that I knew that file represented. When I came to the file marked lustful thoughts, I felt a chill run through my body. I pulled the file out only an inch, not willing to test its size and I drew out a card. I shut it at its detailed content. I felt sick to think that such a moment had been recorded. A feeling of humiliation and anger ran through my body. One thought dominated my mind. No one must ever see these cards. No one must ever see this room. You ever feel like that sometimes? You ever feel so ashamed of what you've done that how could you ever face anyone? Going on. I have to destroy them. In an insane frenzy, I yanked the file out. Its size didn't matter now. I had to empty and burn the cards. But as I took the file at one end and began pounding it on the floor, I could not dislodge a single card. I became desperate and pulled out a card only to find it as strong as steel when I tried to tear it. Defeated and utterly helpless, I returned the file to its slot. Leaning my forehead against the wall, I let out a long, self-pitying sigh. That is when I saw it. The file bore people I had shared the gospel with. The handle was brighter than those around it, newer, almost unused. I pulled it on its handle, and a small box not more than three inches long fell into my hands. I could count the cards, it contained on one hand. Then tears came. I began to weep, sob so deep that the hurt started in my stomach and it shook through me. I fell on my knees and cried. I cried out of shame from the overwhelming shame of it all. The rows of foul shelves swirled in my tear-filled eyes. No one must ever, ever know of this room. I must lock it up and hide the key. Then as I looked through my tears, I saw him enter the room. No, please, not him, not here. Anyone but Jesus. I watched helplessly as he began to open the files and read the cards. I couldn't bear to watch his response. A few times I looked at his face and I saw such sadness that it tore at my heart. He seemed intuitively to go to the worst boxes. Why did he have to read every one? 
Finally, he turned and he looked at me from across the room, and he looked at me with pity in his eyes. But this was a pity that didn't anger me. I dropped my head and covered my face with my hands, and I began to cry. He walked over and he put his arm around me. He could have said so many things, but he didn't say a word. He just cried with me. Then he got up and he walked back to the wall of files. He started at one of the room and he took out a file. And one by one, he began to sign his name on the card. No, I shouted, rushing to him. All I could find to say was no, no. As I pulled the cord from him, his name shouldn't be on these cards. But there it was, written in red, so rich, so dark, and so alive, the name of Jesus covered mine. It was written in blood. He gently took the card back. He smiled in a sad smile and began to sign the cards. I don't think I ever understood how he did this so quickly. But the next instant, it seemed, I heard him close the last fall, foul, and I walked back to my side. He placed his hand on my shoulder and said, It is finished. I stood up, and he led me out of the room. There was no lock on the door. There were still cards to be written. (coughs) There you have the story of the room. I remember the first time I I heard this story. I was at a state of point in my life where I pretty much had lost almost everything I had. And I remember I was working a job doing chrome plating. And I was living in a single one room, lost everything, had pretty much just the clothes in my car. And I was chrome plating in a plant that was 130 degrees in temperature with acid bouncing all over and touching your skin and eating the flesh right off your, off your body. And the smell was so horrible. But that's all I had at the time to keep me going. But I did have the Sabbath day. And I reached the point in my life as I thought through all of these stories that the job I had didn't require me to work on the Sabbath. Well, one Friday, the owner of the company came to me and he said, I need you to work tomorrow because I'm going through a divorce and I can't go to this seminar. I need you there. And I, and I explained to him, I said, you know, I can't go. I keep a Sabbath day. And he said, well, either you go or I, can't, I go and I lose my family. And I told him at that time, I said, I've pretty much lost everything I had. The only thing I have left is the Sabbath day. And then he finally said, all right, then I will go. That was the turning point in my life. It was as if I had looked at that door and Jesus Christ had said, go write more cards. I believe everyone who hears this sermon can tell a similar story in your life as I just said. None of us are unique in our own lives. But when God brings us to the point that we are in that room, it makes the difference. It's when we go back to that scripture that every idle word is to be accounted for. I'm going to come back to those scriptures in just a second. Have you had your room yet? Because you see, we don't have to wait until we die to go into that room. You have been given the opportunity now to visit that room, to clear the slate, and to remove the files that prevent you from being a part with Jesus Christ and the Father. So now, let's go back to where we were. Matthew 12 and verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word men speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Now that we've heard the story of the room, is, you're looking at this a little different. Because you see, we don't take the time to isolate our words and our thoughts by specifics. We, we think in generalities quite often. 
So we don't realize how often it is that we are doing things that we need to make these changes. Every idle word, in other words, every thought, every lustful thought, every hateful thought, every evil thought, every good thought, God's recorded it all. God has recorded every single thing as this incredible list of, of accounts, like the 17-year-old when he wrote this, and he said, how is it possible in my life that I could have recorded all of this? And some of us are a lot older than 17. Verse 37, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Each one of us, unless we repent in this life, are stand, going to stand before that judge on the judgment seat. Our speech reveals the sort of treasure stored in our hearts. Matthew 12 again. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You ever say to somebody, they, they get under pressure and all of a sudden a vulgarity comes out? They go, oh, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Well, that's like an orange. You squeeze an orange, what comes out, what's inside of it? When I began working on this sermon just two days ago, I woke up in the middle of the night with this horrible feeling of my past. And all of the things all of a sudden begin running through my mind, and immediately I'm in repair of repentance, things I never thought about before. And so when you go through these things and you're at the throne of God, there may be times that God will bring things up in your mind. Why? To cleanse and get them out so that Jesus Christ can write his name on that card and move it. Take it out of that file and give you a fresh, clean work slate to work from. Satan also can bring up things about you in your past that you haven't thought about before to try and discourage you. When those times happen, you immediately go into your room with Jesus Christ and have them removed. Because you see, once you've repented, they're done. And Satan cannot use those against you ever again. James 1 says this, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart speaks. What's inside, whether you actually speak it out loud or not, God knows the hearts of man, and he knows the hearts, what's inside of you. But here's what's amazing about this whole story is that God can isolate every moment of your life, sign his name through Jesus Christ's blood and remove it and give you a fresh start. Every year he gives us the opportunity to reconfirm our commitment at, in our covenant with him through our baptism at Passover to accept the blood of Jesus Christ and give us a fresh, clean start. Every year you have that opportunity every single day on your knees before the throne of God. Preserving the stored treasures in our hearts. Proverbs 4 says this, Above all else, guard your heart. What an amazing statement. Guard your heart. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he was talking to Timothy, this is an amazing story. He said, I know no other that naturally cares for the affairs of others than Timothy. Now, Paul knew a lot of people, the Apostle Paul. I mean, he knew a lot of people. He knew the disciples. He knew the apostles. He was teaching, teaching across the, the areas he went to. He went across Asia. He was everywhere. He knew thousands of people. But he said he knew one person who naturally cared for the affairs of others. And yet, even to that one person, you know what he had to write him? Don't become weary of well-doing. In other words, even the person who has been given the gift that their first inclination is to help others can get tired of it. And so he had to, had to even warn Timothy not to, not to give up. So now this is telling me that naturally inside of us, it isn't our natural nature to care about others first before we care about ourselves. It isn't natural for us to give our lives for someone else. It isn't a part of our heart to be like Jesus Christ. That's something you have to work at. That's something you have to go to God and, and ask him to give you that gift of repentance, to give you that desire to want to be like him and to love him. 
You know, when I was younger and I first came into the church and I looked and I asked, how does, how does a person do these things? And the simple answer that came back to me was, you need to love God. Well, I understood that. I said, but tell me how. And it's taken me a lifetime to understand how. It's right here. It's, it's in the heart. It's something that you begin to realize who he is, what he stands for, the very nature of Jesus Christ and his Father, and what it's all about. When you begin to compare this world and all that's like it, it's horrible. And you begin to say, no, I need to be like this. And you look for and you anger for the sense of purity and righteousness and, and, and have all this evil taken away from you. And you begin to look closer and closer to become like Jesus Christ is. He will help you to do that. Verse 24, Proverbs 4. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. You know, quite often you can't even be around people that you used to be around anymore. Because the language is so vulgar, the attitude is so hate-filled, that you just can't be a part of that. Quite often, you just got to turn off the news. I so I just can't watch this anymore. And fill your minds with the spirit of good things from God. Verse 25 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet. And be steadfast in all your ways. And do not turn to the right or keep to the left. Keep your foot from evil. If you're going to walk that path to clear that room of all those cards, this is how you start. You first learn and ask God to love him. That is a gift. Because you see, we, it's hard for us to love something we don't know. And you have to take time to get to know God. That means every day you wake up, you thank God for where you go through. And any thought that's in your mind that's bad, you ask God to purge it. You set your course and your path every single day to focus on God first. You meditate and you pray daily. And God will guide your steps. He will set your path, and you won't turn to the left and to the right. And each day you will find your path will be less and less wobbly as you walk straighter and straighter to that path toward Jesus Christ as you guard your heart to be like he is. Psalm 51 says this, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would I give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken, contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. When you set your heart toward him, your spirit will be humbled. You realize that the path that you're on cannot be achieved any other way without his help. That guidance will keep you in that path as you go. <laughs> Isaiah 66, 1 says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and, my earth, and the earth my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this will I look, on him who has a poor and a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Do you know it's possible to be close enough to God that when you step out of those boundaries, you feel the change of the loss of the spirit of God? I've been in rooms where we've had a spirit-filled room and the people were, uh, it was just, just a warm, comforting spirit and someone will walk in and never say a word, and the spirit in that room would change. The spirit of God will feel the violation of an evil spirit near it. That's an amazing story. There was, there was people who came to my house one time, turned out to be, I just call them evil people, and, and this never happened before. My mother-in-law's dog, <laughs> this is a true story, never did this before, ran upstairs, hid in the bathroom, and never came out till they left. I said, wow. Some years later, I realized why that dog did that. I should have ran with it. 
That's an amazing story. Never, it was with me for years. Never did that again. Ran upstairs. All right, I, I don't really have time to go through each of these, but I'm going to leave these with you. When you get the DVD, go back and look up each of the scriptures. Is that David was a man after God's own heart. So when I was doing I said, well, if I want to be like God and pr pr to pr protect my heart, for, I said, I'm going to go see what David did. So I've got some points here, but I don't have time to go through them like I want to because I spent too much time in the buildup of the story. But I'm going to give you the pretexts, uh, I mean the, the, uh, the points, and then you can go back with each of the scriptures and, and look them up each time. First, humility. David was a humble man. Second, he was reverent. All right? he, was, he, had, he had the reverence toward God himself. He was respectful. You want to have the character of God, these are the things that you work toward. He was respectful to God. And what I've got here is I've got a, a scriptural quote that you can be able to just get the DVD, and then you'll be able to go back and look at each one of these. There's 10 of them I'm giving you. He was trusting. He trusted God in all that he did. He was loving. Like he says here, he says, I love you, O my Lord, my strength. I mean, everything he did focused on God's way and to, for God. He was devoted to that way and devoted to God. He says, you have filled my heart with greater joy than when than grain and new wine abounds. In other words, he's that, how do, when you feel happy, when you get your paycheck, uh, when your house is full, when you, got to, you get a new car, but God says his greatest joy wasn't in any of that is when he was with God. You know, some of, the, some of the most exciting times of my life now is Saturday mornings when I'm preparing sermons. I don't know, it's just, it just different. It's just uplifting and powerful. When you read a scripture, and then you've, you've felt this. I mean, I'm, I'm no different than any of you all, so I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to say that I am. But I'm just saying when you, when you look at a scripture and all of a sudden, wow, I never saw that before. You know, I'll, I'll call Audrey and I'll say, man, come see this. You got you to see this. You ain't going to believe this. You know, she'll come in and burst my bubble and says, yeah, we knew that all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a little slow. I just got it. <laughs> but each person goes through that in your life, don't you? When you find something you've been praying about, God opens your mind. It's like, wow, this, I got to go share this with somebody. You know, that's the way I feel on Saturday mornings when I'm working on a sermon. And people say, he says, when I give the sermon, he says, you're always excited when you give these sermons. And I said, well, yeah, I just learned it. <laughs> you know, I'm a little old, but I just learned it. You know, so, so it's those things that God gives you. And so Dave is saying here, his greatest joy when he's with God. Our greatest joy, if you want to have the love of God in you, have the joy to be with him. And you'll, you'll never be disappointed. God will never disappoint you like human beings do. He gave God recognition for who he was. He says, I'll praise God. He was faithful in all that he did. Yeah, he made mistakes. You know amazing about, about um, David? When he made the mistakes, he admitted them. He didn't try to hide them. He had actually admitted them. We talk about David and Bathsheba, but I'm telling you, when he numbered Israel and all those people died, more people suffered during that time than when he was with, with Bathsheba. I mean, there was basically a household in, in, uh, in Israel that didn't suffer because of what David did. So he was faithful to God. He was obedient. Yeah, he made his mistakes just like you and I will. And he had his room and those cards that God had to go in and remove those cards and sign Jesus' name over them. But he was obedient. And above all, he was repentant. That's what we need to have. That humble, contrite spirit brings you to repentance. And through repentance is where God can work with you. When you reach that state and say, God, you've got to help me. I can't do this on my own. But through God's help, he can get you there. So now, let's go back and wrap this up now and go back to where we were. Matthew 12. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words will be condemned. We'd uncovered the first verse just a few moments ago as we went in through this, and that's what we went through with the heart and the contrite spirit and our words being judged. But see, there's a cause and effect. If you don't reach that stage of repentance and you don't draw close to God and you don't protect your heart, there's a price you're going to pay. Everyone will pay it. There's no one's going to get out of that. Revelation 20 says this, 
Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat, uh, sat on it, and the earth and the heavens fled away from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the judge, dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And thus the room shows the recording of every moment of your life. And it tells you the good and the bad through that time. Now, we'll wrap it up with the story of Lazarus and the rich man. We went through that entire story where Jesus Christ talked to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, in the parable he gave them, says, send them to my family. If they had Moses and they had the prophets, they would, they would, they would, they, what would they do? Jesus said they had Moses and they had the prophets, right? They had Moses and they had the prophets. He said, he said, no, no. He said, Father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Not with Moses and the prophets. He says, no, 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 no. Jesus says, they had Moses and the prophets. He says, no, that's not good enough. Send somebody from the dead. Here's what I'm telling you today as we close it. You, everyone who sees this tape, you have Moses and the prophets. You don't get someone resurrected to come back and tell you. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. In this parable of Lazarus and the rich man, you have just seen the story of what happens in the afterlife, no different than the parable Jesus Christ gave to his disciples and to the Pharisees. So what, it goes, what he goes on to say, but he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though someone rise from the dead. I've seen people ask for, for miracles. I've seen people get miracles and not change their life. I've seen people say, if God will just grant me this and they'll get this incredible value of dollar, I'm going to give it to the church, some of it, some of it. And they don't. I said, you know, that's happened. I said three or four times somebody came to me and said that. You can't bribe God. You know that? You can't bribe God. But now, let's tell the story, the rest of the story. John 12, 9. Jesus just said, even if someone comes back to the dead, from the dead, you will not change if you will not listen to who? Moses and the prophets. In other words, if you're not going to listen to the word of God, to the law of God, though it's been given to you and showed you in black and white, I don't care what I do for you, you're not going to believe it. Amen. So what does Jesus do? He brings back the very person he uses in the parable to show them, to drive his point home. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. Talking about Jesus, this is after the resurrection of Lazarus, the name he used in the parable to tell the Pharisees that you wouldn't change even if he came back from the dead. What did they do? But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on the account of him and many of the Jews went to, to away and believed in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ literally takes the parable, makes it a physical, actual story, puts Lazarus right in front of him and shows him. And so what did they do? Let's kill that man rather than change. You and I now have this story complete. We knew it from a parable. We have seen it visualized in a story written by a man of the room. We see it reinforced through the final words of Jesus Christ and the literal resurrection. If that doesn't work for you, I don't know what will. Amen. God has given us an incredible, wonderful opportunity to draw close to him. All I can say is guard your heart. <laughs> Seek him first and let him guide your lips as he guides your heart. Thank you.